You're listening to Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. Deal by Deal invites you to conversations with experienced independent sponsors and other private equity professionals. Join McGuire Woods partners Greg Hover, Jeff Brooker, and Rebecca Brophy as they explore middle market private equity M&A to provide you with timely insights and relevant takeaways. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Brooker. Welcome to Episode 9 of Deal by Deal, an independent sponsor podcast. I'm pleased to have with me today uh, one of the, the key members of our independent sponsor team here at McGuire Woods, John Finger. Hey, Jeff. Thanks, John, for taking the time to be on this episode. We really appreciate you making the time. So we wanted to talk today about some of the recent really interesting developments that we've seen in the independent sponsor space. And that space has continued to see significant evolution in recent years. And I know where you sit seeing as many deals really as anyone in the space, you could see a lot of interesting stuff. You know, tell me about some of those those recent developments and some of the things that you think are really noteworthy. Yeah. So I think the first thing I would point out is we truly have seen the evolution of independent sponsors becoming a separate asset class within private equity. And as we take a look back many years ago, the independent sponsor model has been around, it seems like forever. Way back then, right? It was um, guy or gal with a deal who was putting something together at the country club and it turned into what became known as fundless sponsors, uh, which we all have found quite pejorative. And so as we've started thinking about the independent sponsor and really over the past seven, eight years, that evolution to being a truly valuable part of the ecosystem within private equity, that validation, that acceptance it truly has become a, a separate asset class. And you see that with private equity funds that have been raised solely or predominantly to invest in independent sponsor-led deals. And the reality is there's significant economics that get paid to the independent sponsor. But I always tell people it's just math. So if the deal is good enough, it can make sense. And so I think that evolution has been demonstrated by the fact that you you do see funds being raised for that express purpose. I think over the past few years, and there's multiple drivers for it, we've also seen an increasing number of larger independent sponsor deals. I think from my perspective, the fat part of the bell curve in years past was 30, 40, 50 million enterprise value deals. Um, and as you, Jeff, and others within our independent sponsor practice group have seen, doubling that and then multiple deals well over $200 million on the independent sponsor side being put together and then ultimately closed. That would be the second biggest, I think, change that I've seen within the community. And then lastly, we have seen a, a real interest on both the independent sponsor and the capital partner side for what we call hybrid structures. In many cases, these were nothing more than just pledge fund type structures. And then ultimately running the gamut towards putting in place a, a structure whereby the capital partner and the independent sponsor have agreed upon economics. Um, under which there's some level of committed capital, oftentimes with discretion on the LP side as to you know what a deal has to look like in order to get closed, a certain number of deals that the LP has the ability to really exercise ultimately discretion over as to what deals get done and what deals don't. And if the situation's not working out right, how the parties get divorced. So, those hybrid structures have have certainly been evident, particularly over the past few years. And there's clearly a lot of money out there chasing different ways to get deployed. And independent sponsors, it seems like, are more interested in finding those structures that, that make sense. So those are probably the few things that I'd, I'd highlight to the group. 
yeah, I have seen, in, especially more recently, a lot of independent sponsors ask us to set up these these little you know sidecar funds or or pass the hat kind of funds where they're taking different economics within that fund or maybe the trying to get increased security in their deals. But it it, it does seem like it's taking a you know in those circumstances baby steps toward a you know a fund or a future kind of committed capital arrangement for them. Clearly one of the important themes in, in recent years is the growing size and sophistication of the of the community of independent sponsors, you know, as a whole. And a segment of those independent sponsors starting to think about starting private equity funds. You know, what have you seen in that regard? Sure. We definitely have seen a substantial increase within the broader private equity community, frankly, of first time funds, but more specifically within the independent sponsor community. I think there are a few things at play. One, there's clearly the recognition that the independent sponsor model, while it is incredible, there are lots of very positive components of it. It's also hard to raise capital on a deal by deal basis. It doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of success finding capital partners for deals. It doesn't mean that independent sponsors aren't doing it on their own. Obviously, they've been able to use placement agents. So that growth in the independent sponsor community continues. At the same time, I do think there is clearly a recognition that there are challenges to it. And so we've definitely seen an increase in independent sponsors, at least thinking about raising a committed fund. And then actually just we got to initial closing on one of our longtime independent sponsors uh, who raised their first committed fund and is very close to a final closing on that fund. So there's definitely been an increase in independent sponsors thinking about it, but there's also been a significant increase in independent sponsors raising committed funds. There's also been a real heightened focus from our LP community in encouraging independent sponsors to raise committed funds, whether that's because they're looking for the ability to anchor those first-time funds, or really just an ability to get more money to work through a channel within private equity that those LPs have found very attractive, all coming back to a very strong increase in independent sponsors raising committed funds. Yeah, yeah, definitely an interesting development. So if I'm an independent sponsor and I'm sitting out here listening to this podcast and thinking, you know, am I am I a candidate for this? You know, when you think of the types of independent sponsors that stand out as particularly good candidates to become a fund manager, what do you think of as far as track record and et cetera? Yeah, well, certainly one of the most critical hallmarks of a successful candidate to become an emerging manager is track record. And we can set aside for the moment attributable track record for groups that are spinning out of private equity, but track record is certainly key. And so the independent sponsor who has the ability to demonstrate a number of successful exits, how many exits, you know, it really depends. But the reality is to get limited partners to have conviction on a first time fund, there need to be, as a general matter, a few exits that the LPs can diligence, understand, and ultimately get comfortable with that sponsor's ability to exit transactions in a, in a good fashion. I think within the private equity community, as well as beyond the past few years, ESG has moved front and center for a lot of what LPs are thinking about and doing. So an independent sponsor, either as a woman or other diverse fund manager where the LPs, many of which have particular requirements, either because that's how they raised a fund to invest in emerging or other managers, whether it's just something that is important to the LP maybe the family office patriarch, whatever it is, that ability to back 
minority fund managers is certainly something that we have seen LPs focus on. But then as a broader statement, the independent sponsors who demonstrate and articulate an ESG focus in whatever fashion, because that's such a broad term, but that paying attention to that part of their investment criteria has certainly been something we've seen be attractive to to LPs. The last thing I would say is you really have to have an infrastructure in place in order to scale to support a committed first-time fund. And so in many cases, that's an independent sponsor who actually has a team of four, five, six investment professionals and others that can relatively cleanly transition to a committed fund. Sometimes it's more a few individuals who maybe worked together in the past that are coming back together um, that maybe were separate to raise a fund. But I think having that infrastructure that the LPs can underwrite and get comfortable is going to allow you to to scale within the committed fund construct is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So you touched on ESG, which I know is a little bit, it's, it's a hot topic today and it's a little bit hard to put your fingers on exactly what that is. But paying mind to that is, is I think, good advice. What else do you think LPs look for in a first-time fund? Sure. Well, taking a step back, certainly in many cases, LPs look to first-time funds because of the ability and quite often reality of outperforming future fund five, fund six, fund sevens. And so LPs are valuing these earlier emerging managers they crave that alignment with the GP, that focus of time from the general partner. And its simplest fashion, the GP can't get it wrong. If those first handful of deals or frankly, first deal or two within a fund one don't do well, that in many cases is going to be the end of fund two, fund three, fund four. And so it's that alignment that I think LPs find so attractive and they look for within these fund managers. At a macro level, in many cases, those first-time funds are sub $500 million vehicles, and that's providing LPs with exposure to what we describe as the lower middle market. And that is a huge focus for many LPs as particularly as funds have gone up market, a lot of candidates for potentially unbanked situations. It seems like the target size of companies has gone down that in the sense, in many cases, companies that used to not have a banker involved, that universe of companies has gone down significantly. And so I think LPs recognize that by focusing on the lower middle market, there is that ability to find unbanked or underbanked target companies. There are a whole host of factors that LPs look for in first-time funds. A few that come to mind, that ability to transact both entry and exit at attractive points, in diverse market times, demonstrating to the LPs that as a GP, you have the ability to put money to work in a smart fashion is critically important. Another important factor, many LPs are looking for specialization, whether that's sector specialists, sometimes it's how you approach transactions, whether it's theme-oriented, It really is about differentiating yourself as a sponsor. It is a very crowded market out there. As many times as we can tell stories about first-time funds being raised, it is a difficult fundraising environment. And so it's about differentiating yourself. And is that your sourcing model? Is that your operational playbook for post-closing? It doesn't have to be sector specialization, but there has to be 
a story, a underwritable story about how you differentiate yourself. I think being coachable is important as a first time fund manager. You know, a lot of LPs are looking for an ability to influence direction, sometimes looking for reduced economics or truly opportunities to anchor the fund. So I think as the fund closes and you look around the room, being coachable and taking those suggestions and really being flexible in how you work with your LP base is something that LPs have found attractive. Co-invest opportunities at its simplest state are very important to LPs, whether an emerging manager or otherwise. But I think in many cases, demonstrating and showing a structure under which LPs are able to get co-invest opportunities is important. The last two, Jeff, and I'll let you weigh in is sure. yeah. team. I, I talked about it before, but it's have you worked together? What skill sets does that team bring to bear? The football analogy, everyone can't be the quarterback or the star wide receiver, right? So as you put together that team for your first time fund, it's thinking about what role is everyone going to play and how does that get the LPs comfortable really with the infrastructure? So understanding lawyers, fund admin, all those different team members that go into a first-time fund, demonstrating that infrastructure is something that LPs are heavily focused on. Yeah, I've seen some sponsors who have really started to build out a team with a focus on building a fund in the future. And when it when it's done well, you can really see how it it just adds gasoline to the fire and the the, the velocity of the deals, but when really everything they do, the pacing picks up and and when it's clicking you can you you can tell you can you know, even as the lawyer we can see it so we talked about building out a team what are some other key steps if you're you know if you're an independent sponsor who's thinking about preparing to raise a fund what are some other key steps that that they should start to think about in the in the early days sure one of the questions that you will get asked closer to the end of that process in many cases of raising a fund but it's reference checks, and it's it's supremely important to a lot of LPs. So I would be thinking about what does that base of references look like and really starting to identify candidates within the broader deal ecosystem. So sometimes it's founders of companies you've acquired and they rolled over into investing alongside of you. CEOs that you've worked with or brought into companies, certainly LPs, which we can get to in a minute, but even then just bankers that, and when I say bankers, I mean investment bankers, boutique bankers, but having a broad set of references from different parts of the deal ecosystem is really important to show LPs. And then Tying back to the LP side, spending a lot of time thinking about how are you going to select your preferred LPs for your fund? So who are the right type of investors for your fund? Are you going to focus on family offices? Are you going to focus on pensions and endowments? Are you going to focus on fund of funds? Finding in your strategy how you think about the right LP base is a key step along that process. And for that investor base, it's really about who is going to help you drive value in your fund formation process, whether that's introducing other LPs to invest in your fund directly, uh, merely attracting other LPs who want to invest alongside what are viewed as the preeminent curs of first-time fund managers, really thinking about who truly wants to see you succeed as an emerging manager and will help, help you make that happen. So I really think one of the most critical steps is, in your mind, thinking about the right investor base for your first-time fund. 
Sure. And so then when we think about, I guess, you know, all, you know, every independent sponsor is out there working on deals. And so for the folks who are thinking about starting a fund and maybe have started taking some concrete steps in that direction, how should they think about, you know, can I roll the deals I'm working on into my first fund? You know, should I roll those deals into, into that fund? And, and are there things that I should be thinking about if, if that's in my mind when I'm thinking about the deals, negotiating the deals? Are there, are there things I should be doing and not doing so that I don't stub my toe and that I, that I do it in a way that's as, as seamless as it can be? Well, certainly first, you want to, as best you can, have alignment and it becomes, it can be a chicken and egg thing, but let's assume that you have an LP base in mind already. I always want the manager to be thinking about what is the right structure that the LPs are going to be comfortable with. Certainly pre-fund deals, it's fabulous in many ways. There are different structures, and, and we can talk through some of those with, with managers as opportunities present, but we certainly have put in place structures, for lack of a better term, warehousing a first deal where an LP provides the capital, and then ultimately that capital gets bought down, for lack of a better term. But putting in place that warehouse structure can be really compelling. It just means you, you have to find alignment early on with the LP or LPs who are going to be warehousing that, that first deal. Certainly thinking about if you truly are going to be, quote, rolling all of that first portfolio company into the fund, there are also structures where some of our emerging managers have done a growth equity type investment into a deal and then ultimately had the fund invest into a deal. And so you always need to be mindful of conflicts, you know, in those growth equity situations. But again, one of the key pieces is the deal pipeline and providing LPs with that demonstrated ability to put money to work in a meaningful fashion relatively quickly. So rolling pre-fund deals is certainly one way to do it. But again, you need to be doing that in tandem with your LPs and then, of course, structuring that with counsel to make sure you think, you think through those issues and ultimately get them documented where that, quote, contribution, if you will, to the new fund can be as seamless as possible. Right, right. And, and so those, you had mentioned that there are certain LPs that might be better as first-time LPs. Do you typically find that the folks who are willing to work with you on rolling those first deals into a first fund and, and be very cooperative and helpful in, in that regard, there's a lot of alignment with this set of folks who make for good LPs in a fund? I do. And there's also very strong alignment with the independent sponsor world. So in the sense that in many cases, you have LPs who will back independent sponsors, but will also back emerging managers. So it's a nice, clean entree to say, I ultimately expect to be raising a fund soon. You know, let's start talking about what that looks like. Also, we have this situation and we want to get a deal closed. So let's get a deal closed, but let's have in place a structure whereby it all or some of it can be put into a fund structure. And so absolutely, those characteristics of LPs that back independent sponsors can often be very strong proponents of a warehouse structure within putting that deal into a first-time fund. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. So if there's an independent sponsor out there and they're considering raising a fund in the future and maybe want to start getting a little bit more concrete about it and maybe kicking the tires... What are your thoughts on some things that they could that they could do to start to explore that world? Sure. Well, first and foremost, reach out to to you and I, Jeff, right? I think leveraging people within your 
universe that can help guide you through the process, help you understand what it takes to get from A to B in raising a first time fund, introducing the right LPs in collaboration with you once we've talked about who to prioritize, but introducing the right LPs to emerging managers is something we as a firm do all the time. As you know, Jeff, lawyers, not placement agents, we can't get paid fees for making those introductions, but that is a big part of what we do within the community. But then also, we have the ability to introduce others, whether fund admin or otherwise, within the emerging manager ecosystem. So we can be a very strong advocate and partner to emerging managers. Relatedly, talking to the right placement agents, there are at least a handful, but in my book, a handful of good placement agents who focus on emerging managers. And so talking to those placement agents who happily will take time to get to know outstanding potential emerging managers, it's extremely valuable because the placement agents have a very good sense of how the market is going to view you as a sponsor. They also will share what's going on in the broader LP community. Yep. But talking about the broader LP community and what LPs are focused on and what they value. I often think about it like someone who's declaring for the draft, right? Test the market a little bit, talk to placement agents. Ultimately, no obligation, of course. Some of our emerging managers don't even use a placement agent for their first fund or for their first closing and may bring in a placement agent for their final closing. But the right placement agents are always happy to make investments in those relationships. So having those conversations is absolutely something I would recommend doing. Build the deal pipeline. We talked about it with rolling pre-fund deals. Having the ability to show LPs within your deck and otherwise what situations you are currently focused on goes a very long way to giving credibility to your model and giving LPs confidence that the money that they commit to your fund is going to get put to work and is going to get put to work in great opportunity. So spending that time to build the pipeline, which obviously is going to benefit the independent sponsor outside of the committed fund as well, but not lose sight of how important that is to demonstrate to LPs Right. They also want to know that they're not going to make a commitment and then the money's going to sit on the sidelines for 12 months waiting for an opportunity to work. Absolutely. It's huge for what LPs are looking for. And then lastly, I'd say, Jeff, refine your why. You talked about it earlier, but you need to be able to articulate as an independent sponsor why you are looking to raise a fund. And whether that's hey, I just don't want to do a deal-by-deal capital raise anymore. I can do more deals with a committed fund than an independent sponsor. I have a value truly, whether distressed or otherwise, orientation. And having that committed capital allows me to move quicker. Really take some time to think about your why and then also how you're going to articulate that to the LP community as you think about what it would look like to raise a fund. Yep, that makes sense. And I, I think it, this has all been you know, really good advice. And I hope that if there are any independent sponsors out there who are thinking about raising a fund or think it, it may be in the future for them, that this has been helpful to them. And you know, as John mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You know, relationships as we've covered here are very important. You can't do it by yourself. And all of this referral work and kind of informal help, it's all unbillable relationship 
building that's just part of being part of in in our friends and family network and and you we're we're happy to help and invested in seeing the community grow and do well so you know i would encourage you to reach out as a firm and and as individuals we are very giving with our time and 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 really interested in in helping folks and jeff the last thing i would say is i think it's always important to hear from others who have done it and are doing it and so there are a lot of things that you'll see from mcguire woods in particular as you think about talking to and who are the right LPs and otherwise we have a, another podcast. I know this is a great one focused on independent sponsors. The podcast is called fund flow and it'll be really for all sorts of emerging managers. And so we're going to have truly preeminent emerging managers, LPs, placement agents, and otherwise. So this was a good first step, Jeff, for emerging managers. But if you're an independent sponsor thinking about an emerging, becoming an emerging manager, definitely make sure you listen to Fund Flow in the coming weeks as we have some really impressive guests who will be joining us there as well. Well, that's great. And, and John, thanks again for, for joining us. You know, your insights have been really incredible. And, I'm, and I, I know that the folks who listen to this podcast are going to get a lot out of it. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. To learn more about today's discussion and our commitment to the independent sponsor community, please visit our website at McGuireWoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.